If you had any doubts about what's going on out there in the Eurodollar world, then these should be put to rest really quickly by the data we got today from the world's second largest economy and arguably its most important. If you were wondering about the plight of China's yuan and why it was struggling so badly, we'll put them to rest here. And I don't mean to exaggerate or oversell it or engage in clickbait here. There's cause to be concerned because when I saw the, the, the statistics that we're about to go over, the word that came to mind for me was fleeing. When the world's most sophisticated investors, dollar providers, companies that have done business and wanted to do business in China are leaving China at this rate or what's indicated by these numbers, you have to pay attention to what's going, especially since it is consistent in the overall whole China's yuan falling, Chinese economy struggling, all of it fits together, liquidity risk, dollar problems, all of them coming together in such a short condensed period of time. Because remember, reopening, reopening was supposed to be this big thing. Now I said, you know, don't buy into the hype over reopening, the problems there are much bigger, but for, for quite a while there, reopening was going to be not just good for the Chinese, but good for the global economy. And then relatively quickly, it started to dawn on most people that reopening wasn't, wasn't performing as it was advertised. And worse than that, over more recent months and weeks, Reopening isn't just failing, it's beyond that. We're, we're far beyond a disappointing outcome from the Chinese economy and the Chinese system. And again, the statistics show that. Earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago, we got the initial uh, assessment from China's SAFE, which is the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, which measures foreign direct investment. That's investment from the outside that goes into China. Uh, this is a more comprehensive measure. It's the other measure of foreign direct investment I'm really focused on. I'll get into that later. But SAFE's numbers on foreign direct investment were already, already worrisome. One measure of new foreign investment in China fell to the lowest level in 25 years in the second quarter, fueling concerns about how much geopolitical tensions and the economy slowing recovery can hurt business confidence. Direct investment liabilities, a gauge of foreign direct investment in China, slumped to just 4.9 billion US dollars in the April-June period, according to figures released by SAFE on Friday. That's again earlier this month. That was down 87% from the same period last year and was the smallest amount in any quarter in the data going back to 1998. And as I said, there is a second set of foreign direct investment uh, statistics. I hate that word statistics that are put together by China's Ministry of Commerce, and they were even worse than what SAFE had shown. So we've got SAFE foreign direct investment, we've got China's yuan, the world's second largest economy, arguably its most important, and bankruptcies in some of its more troubled financial sectors that it seemed to be spilling over across the rest of the financial system. But first, I'm Jeff, this is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. And if you're willing, if you want to, and join me again a couple Fridays from today, it's September 1st, that's a Friday evening around 6.30 Eastern Daylight Time, we'll be holding a webinar to talk about some of the stuff we don't get to go over here on YouTube, give you a sense of what we do in our memberships and our research subscriptions, which are available still at a sale, their sale offers, our anniversary sale still ongoing, at least for a couple more days. You can check out the, the webinar, sign up at the link in the description of this video, as well as the sale page for our, our memberships and research subscriptions. So China's plight is not really about China's plight, but it's becoming a more global phenomenon, at least directly through things like foreign direct investment and dollar providing activities through, through instruments like euro bonds and the hidden stuff that we don't get to see, the shadow stuff, which is starting to really come out and not in a good way. But reacting to the Ministry of Commerce uh, estimates for foreign direct investment last month, not even this month, but last month, the Chinese government spokesman said, ah, don't worry about it. These are just numbers. 
We believe short-term fluctuation in the numbers will not affect foreign investors' optimism toward China's development. The atmosphere for further expansion of FDI to China has not changed, said Zhu Bing, director of Ministry of Finance, uh, Department of Foreign Investment Administration, when the figures were released last month in July, about the month of June. Um, not everybody's buying this, hey, this is just a short-term fluctuation. Uh, Jens Esklund, Esklund, president of the EU Chamber of Commerce in China, said after the second quarter economic data was released that he was almost certain the confidence levels among European companies in op operating in China had dropped further. So there's geopolitics, but there's also economics because many companies cited the uncertain economic climate as well as the lack of business opportunities going forward. So the Chinese economy, China's responses to the economy, those are hindering foreign direct investment. And rather, being, rather than being a short-term fluctuation, the lack of interest in doing business and investing in China explains a lot about why reopening failed. Because again, reopening was from the Chinese perspective, and they were counting on a substantial external boost to really get things jump-started to jumpstart all the processes so that reopening could then combine with an external boost to create the animal spirits and the vigors that everyone talks about with economic recoveries, the virtuous circle of what economic recoveries actually are. But instead, external problems continue to compound, not just in terms of weak demand for goods made in China, but also weak investment, which spills over all over the place. Now, I mentioned the State Administration of Foreign Exchange version of foreign direct investment, which was a 25-year low, somewhat positive uh, in terms of foreign direct investment inflows. The July numbers from the Ministry of Finance, that's the other set of foreign direct investment. I really hope this is a mistake. I really hope this is a typo or a fat finger because I'm looking at the figures. And to be clear here, this is this is uh, for, through a third-party provider. So... Uh, for what it's worth, take that for what it what it means, because um, I've looked at this uh, look at these numbers, and there's no way this can be possibly true, can it? Though it is consistent with the struggles that we're seeing in China, and I've tried to confirm these figures. And if it turns out that these are a mistake, I don't think they are. But if it turns out they are, I certainly will alert you. But according to this third party data provider, which has been reliable to this point. Um, Foreign direct investment, this is accumulated year to date through the month of July, was 766.7 billion RMB. These are in local renminbi terms. In June, the accumulated total was 980 billion. In May, the accumulated total was 843.5 billion. And I hope you realize the, ma the magnitude of what I'm saying here. Accumulated. That means the May number is five months total. Every month we pile on a different, uh, more inflows on foreign direct investment. So the number should be constantly going up. And as you see on the chart I'm showing you here, every single year, that's what you see. That as, as the year goes on and we accumulate one more month after another after another, the accumulated total expands higher and higher through the years. Now, some years are better than others but the accumulated number continues to go up throughout the year because every month there's more direct investment. Depends on how much investment comes in, but it's always been positive. But as I just told you, in July, the number wasn't just negative. For the first time in all of these years of data, it was substantially negative. That's why I'm thinking maybe there's a typo here, but even if it's not, even if it's like April or March's number where the number was was really small positive, and that's the month of March, which remember what happened in the month of March? Um, that makes two months this year that are complete uh, complete anomalies. We've never seen this in the, in the Ministry of Finance's FDI, or Ministry of Commerce's FDI numbers before. And to be that large of a decline on an accumulated basis, that's, that's, it's just wow. I mean, that's that's again what you what, what I said at the beginning. The word that comes to mind is fleeing. I really hope that's a, that's not the right number because otherwise the consequences, the implications, not just from China, are dramatic. But it does fit with the overall 
what, what the overall atmosphere, the overall direction that China's economy is taking, that China's financial system is taking, which we'll get to in just a second here, the currency is taking, despite uh, enormous interventions over the last couple of days that are producing uh, limited results on top of the constant intervention since the end of June. It's a picture of major problems in, again, the world's second largest and arguably its most important economy. So if this data proves to be faulty, I will let you know that. But right now, this is what it looks like in terms of accumulated foreign direct investment through the month of July. That's, that's one that you have to stand up and take notice. And again, what we're really talking about here is not just economic struggles and financial problems. It's talking about monetary issues that go right to the heart of the matter here. Funding all of these various opportunities and projects through foreign direct investment or euro bonds, bank loans, some of the other euro dollar stuff that gets embedded in the currency exchange rate, as well as all sorts of financial indications around the world, including maybe why interest rates, though they have gone higher recently, haven't gone all that much higher. Desire for safety and liquidity isn't that difficult to understand. Look, dollar providers look at the Chinese and think, there's, a too, there's way too many risks here to continue to provide dollars at the same levels as before. And that's going to be a huge problem, an even bigger problem in offshore euro bond financing because you've probably heard by now, large, the, the, the big Chinese developer that we've been talking about since 2021, Evergrande, they finally filed Chapter 15 bankruptcy in New York. Now, that doesn't mean the company's out of business. It just, it's... Chapter 15 is that the, is the firm trying to protect itself from New York based or United States based creditors because these euro bonds are um, they operate under the laws and regulations of the United States and New York, which tell, tells you a lot about the the offshore euro dollar system, how it's an offshoot of the global domestic system. It's just lots of it takes place outside. And one of the reasons why the euro dollar took off and took over as much as it did is because it did it piggybacked not just on the US dollar denomination, but also very importantly on US laws and, and uh, the settlement and the practice of settlement for disputes using US courts and those types of things. So what Evergrande has done has, yes, they're trying to protect themselves from US creditors after defaulting on numerous Euro bonds, but there's also there's also a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen from here because the company keeps reporting mammoth losses and how these losses get resolved and who gets what losses, that's going to determine uh, how much of an impact Evergrande's bankruptcy will have in a systemic fashion. And it's already being somewhat overshadowed by developments inside China too. Because we can't forget that China has an internal financing problem. These things are all linked together. When it's illiquid and hard to fund activities from external sources, it's going to spill over into internal problems as well because risk aversion, that's, that's one of the most universal, uh, the universal factors that can either get things moving again or really uh, lead things down the wrong direction, the long, wrong path. And the more risk averse funding providers become, whether they're outside China or inside China, the less liquid the system becomes, the more it exposes more troubled firms. The old adage of the right, or the uh, the receding tide revealing who's swimming naked. Well, the tide is receding in all fronts in China, and it's revealing quite a lot of naked swimmers, including a firm that we talked about before, or written about before, Zhang Grong Trust, which is not necessarily a real estate developer. Jean Grand Trust is a firm which has missed at least two payments that we know of out of 270 products totaling 39.5 billion yuan that are due this year, according to market reports. And here's the important thing about Jean Grand Trust. Not only is it one of the biggest wealth management product firms out there in China, it also was um, one of its biggest shareholders is a company called Zhongzhi Enterprise Group, which was a lumber business, believe it or not, which also has a large stake in Zhang Grand Trust. And Zhongzhi is also a conglomerate which holds 
uh, ownership stakes in five other licensed financial firms, including a mutual fund, two insurers, and is invested in five other wealth management companies and four wealth management units, which means that as Zhang Grong experiences liquidity problems, that leads to potentially problems with Zhang Ji. And as we know from our experience in the 2000s, that when parent companies have troubled children, the troubled children tend to be trouble for the parent company. And the liquidity issues spill over not just from one subsidiary, or not just say limited one subsidiary, they tend to spill over through the parent into some of the others, especially if it leads to downgrades and changes in assessment of those parent companies. So you've got these large companies, large wealth management companies, shadow banks in China, that are already having troubles around the edges. At the same time, the Chinese system is experiencing massive external problems, maybe even really massive if that FDI number is correct. Eurobond issues, bank funding, all of it combined, all of it embedded in the CNY exchange rate that we continue to follow that suggests, again, the simplest equation in economics, small e economics. CNY down equals bad. And this is not bad just for China. This is bad for everyone. As China struggles to attract investments, as, as, as investors flee from China, they're not just going to say, well, I'm going to re redeploy my assets elsewhere. They're already considering several steps ahead what China's troubles will mean for the overall global system. As they pull back from China, they're going to be pulling back from a whole lot more. If you want to see another video about China and Euro dollars and the Euro dollar system, check out the video linked below me. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much to research subscribers, as well as our Euro dollar university members, some of whom you see right next to me. And until next time, take care.